This is the 60th anniversary this year of the launch of the Ian Productions' James Bond movies, which started, of course, in 1962 with their first James Bond movie, Dr. No. In Dr. No, Sean Connery playing Bond really defined the true on-screen character of James Bond for decades to come. The Bond character and his quirks, likes, dislikes, the whole persona were defined in Dr. No. So yes, let's get on with Dr. No celebrating 60 years since its release in 62. We have with us today a couple of guests who are in our Facebook group, the worldwide community of spy movie fans, which you should all join. We have Morgan from Canada and Pietro from the UK. Thanks for joining us, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's going to be fun. All right, let's start off at the beginning of the movie. Wow. First, we have the gun barrel sequence. This has become a symbol of the Ian production James Bond movies, and fans seem to really love it. Maurice Binder, thank you very much. Guys, what do you think? His influence on the rest of the franchise. I like it. Um, I think it really works. It, well, right, as a film in its own right, it really works and it introduces with all the, because after the gun barrel, you then go into all the, all the lights and everything. Yes. Um, and it really brings the film to life and makes it vibrant. And, and so as a standalone film, I think it's a good introduction to the movie. Yeah. We hadn't seen anything as it like became it became iconic to James Bond, um, I I wonder if it was a happy accident or if it was ever designed that way. Um, I don't know. Um, But I think it really works. And, um, yeah, um, the the early Daniel Craig films did look a bit odd by not having the um, the gun barrel at the beginning. Well, let let me take you back to 1962. Mm -hmm. And uh, prior to 1962, you had, you know, spy movies. You had, you know, North by Northwest, which was, I think, in 59 or something. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, 62, you're in the theater. You sit down, you know, and you're waiting for the film to start. And it opens up, and you see these dots flashing across. And, you know, it's got the producer's name. And then all of a sudden, a man appears, turns, and he fires right into the audience, and you have the blood pouring down. And then you get hit with this James Bond thing. And it's like, wow. It's like, you've never seen anything like this before. Yeah. And it, you know, the, the dots are bouncing all around and then it go, you hear the bond theme and then it goes into the girls dancing and all that stuff. And then, and then into three by mice. You've never seen anything like this in your life in the theaters. What's this all about? Right. And then it yeah. dot opens up and then you're into, into the world of James Bond. It's, Next to, I think, uh, his introduction of his name, yeah. the most <laughs> iconic, maybe the second most uh, iconic moment in, in motion picture history, right? And it's been the staple ever since yeah. for most of the films, for all of the films. And it's it's something, as a, a fan of Bond, you always look forward to. It's the very first thing. You're yeah. sitting down, you're waiting for the film to start, and you want to see that gun barrel. That yeah. is... That is the moment, and then it takes you away. It's yeah. it's just yeah. tremendous. Like you said, well, we haven't for, seen anything for, for like me, it before. Yeah, for, for me today, when there's 20 minutes of previews, you know, when you sit at the theater and there's preview after preview after preview, that gun barrel sequence comes in and it's like, pow, it's Bond time. Right? <laughs> Forget the yeah. previews, we're in it now. Absolutely. And that's, I think they screwed that up with the Daniel Craig stuff when they started moving it all around. Yeah. It's like, it's, I did. It belongs at the beginning because it sets you up for, okay, now it's time for Bond. Yeah, I mean, they should learn from Coca-Cola, right? Coca-Cola tried to change their formula once, and it's like, oh, well, that didn't work out too well. And they went back to the original formula. The formula works. It's great. Let's keep it. (laughs) I thought thought that with Casino Royale, as it was Bond at the start of the career, and he had to learn um, and take everything up, I thought it was okay starting without, but by the time you got to Skyfall, you should have had the gun barrel yeah. right at the top. I'll tell you what, yeah. with Skyfall, it's one of the most disappointing moments. You know, first of all, they took four years to make it, Quantum of Solace, you know, 2008, 2012, four years. And 
you know, the interviews with Sam Mendes saying, I'm going to make a classic Bond film, and, you, you know, his favorite film is Live and Let Die and all that stuff, and you're really, really looking forward to it. You're sitting in the theaters, you know, you haven't seen an opening gun barrel since 2002's Die Another Day, right? And you're just, you know, you just can't wait. Bond's already been rebooted with Casino and Quantum, right? And at the end of Quantum, you had yeah. the gun barrel. You're thinking, okay, here we go, here we go. Nothing. Yeah. And you go, Where is it? Where's the gun barrel? For me personally, I was in shock for it took me like 15, 20 minutes to get over the fact that there was no opening gun there. I couldn't understand what is going on here. So, yeah, yeah it, was a, it was a big misstep. All um, right, Barbara, Michael out there, if you're listening. All right, we want the gun barrel. <laughs> at the beginning. Yeah, at the beginning. <laughs> right where it belongs. Like, it's like Star Wars without, you know, a long time ago in a galaxy far, yeah, far away. Exactly. Can you imagine if that wasn't there? All right, let's look at the cool title sequences. Now, while Dr. No had no pre-title sequence, wasn't done yet for the Bond movies, it had a very cool, hip title sequence, which would become a hallmark of James Bond movies to come, of course. We love the title sequences and always are looking forward to the cool graphics, the motion, the half-naked women, or whatever. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Let me me stop you there. You just said half-naked women. That wasn't in Dr. No. I know, I know. Us, but they were clothed. That the, the half naked women. I mean, really, on the whole title sequence thing, you have the sequence in Doctor No where you've got silhouettes, but they're clothed. Yeah. Then you had Robert Brownjohn take over for the next two movies, <laughs> and then he had a falling out with Harry, and they brought Maurice back in, starting with Thunderball all the way through License to Kill. Robert Brownjohn's the one that brought to the Bond movies, the concept of displaying moving images on mm. bodies, models' bodies, but they're clothed. Yep. So all the way through the first three, they're clothed, fully yep. clothed, where you know, it's not, there's not the silhouette kind of thing where it's like, do they have anything on? Yeah. You know they're clothed there. So I want to just be, you said half-naked women. No, I said we're looking character. forward to that in future ones. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> okay. Which I still am. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But... That whole thing projecting on the on the bodies actually happened accidentally when he saw someone stand in front of the projector when they were doing something, previewing something, and the images were showing on this on this person's body, and that's where he got the idea. It's like, oh, that's kind of cool. We'll do that. Yeah, that was minute. that was Robert Brown John, and yeah, he, Robert that Brown actually, John. That, yeah, that actually started though the first one that first movie that did that. I can't remember the name of the movie. But it was from nineteen twenty where they st- they started doing this projection on on the human body. Yeah, there's a lot of things that have been done before. Uh, Bond wasn't the first to do pre-title sequences either, right. but they certainly popularized it. Yeah. So, what do you think of the cool title sequence here? We get a lot of we got a lot of 1962 graphics there with the dots and the colors and the greens and yellows and purples and stuff. I, I liked it. I thought it was great. I mean, it's the first film, right? Yeah, yeah. They didn't know what they had, right? So they just did the best they could. And you got the dancers yeah. and all that stuff, you know, and the and then it goes into the three blind mice and yes. all that stuff. I thought it was it was it was quite good. And we're talking 1962. You had never seen anything like that no, prior to no. you've ever seen in the theaters. And those so dots was, really kind of made you feel like it was the 60s too. I mean, it really was of the time. It was, and they've they've done that often with their movies. They've brought in the you know the the local talent for for title songs and and other things too. So you kind of get the feel of the period. Certainly, live and let die, and so on. So there, there's a lot of cool stuff that that they did. And again, the concept of them doing stuff we haven't seen before, that's the part here that's going to continue forever with the Bond series and had continues for these sixty years. It's continued. So that's pretty cool. All right. So as as I said earlier, what I like about that title sequence is just the vibrancy of it all, all these flashing lights and dots. It's like, um, as, um, um, you know, someone said earlier, it's like people go, what's all this all about? And then suddenly, just as you get used to it, you suddenly (laughs) go into three blind mice and it must be playing with your mind a bit. And I just love it. Yeah. And, and we've all c- grown accustomed to it now, and we—I mean, we—we're all looking forward to not only the pre-title sequences now, which we didn't have in Doctor No, but the title sequences have been pretty dang cool in all the Bond movies after that. All right, good. All right, so so Morgan, you you made the comment about the let's take yourself back to 1962. That's the cool part about these things is it's like you, there was no formula yet; they're building the formula here. 
And you're sitting there, and like you said, you're seeing this stuff, and it's like, what the heck are they doing? All right, just a second. Eric is joining us from Texas in the U.S. So thanks, Eric. Welcome. All right, now that Eric's with us, we're going to get back to this. We talked about the title sequence and so on. And and this is the first outing for Ian Productions, Dan Jack, on its first James Bond movie. And there's no pre-title sequence in Dr. No, as we said. But the lack of it has influenced the future Bond movies, which always included and made other movies included as well. No question that Bond not was not the first for pre-title sequences, but man, did they popularize it in a big way and really a dramatic way and made other movies and movie franchises go along with the pre-titles. Right. All right. Now, the music. I think uh, we talked a little bit, Morgan talked a little bit about the music as it's coming on. And, of course, this iconic music that we have grown to love is terrific. And, I mean, really, could it be any better? I don't think it could be any better. <laughs> I think it's just absolutely perfect. The Bond theme music is something that we just love hearing throughout the movie as they do the different variations of it. The title song has also become a big thing. Dr. No had no title song with words, just the funky music. <laughs> Play that funky music. But the <laughs> lack of the title, again, the lack of it here influences the future Bond movies like Monty Norman and John Barry who scored John Barry scored I think 11 Bond movies they had a mm-hmm. tremendous impact on the Bond music so, yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you there again Dan because you you made the you made the comment that you know there's no there's no words to the title sequence well this title sequence actually has two songs in it and to me it's the second part of it, the three blind mice, yeah. that sets up the way title sequences go in the future. Okay. So you've got you've got the introduction of the James Bond theme song, yeah. but then in future movies, that's not used as the title sequence. All right, right, right. That's used for James Bond stuff during the during the movies, but the title sequence itself gets its own song. So the second half of the title sequence is Three Blind Mice. Yeah, that they got done by, by by uh, Byron Lee and the Dragonaires. Yeah, right. So it does it does move into that, and it does set the stage for how title sequences are going to go in the future. I think. Yeah, no, I agree. There you go. That's good. Point. Yeah. So we got the music. Any other comments on the music and stuff? Yeah. The, the only other comment I'd make about the music is the music is really important because over half of the Academy Awards. That the Bond series has won has been for music. Yeah. So it's 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 really the thing that seems to get recognized out there more than any of the other production stuff that gets done. And they use that Bond theme pretty heavily in the first part of the film. You know, Bond's coming out of the elevator. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's, the plane's landing and all that stuff, and he's he's it's at the airport and he's walking around, right? So it's in the background. It's there. And it really establishes a link between that theme and this character of James Bond. And, you know, it's, you know, they, they set the, uh, the template right there. Anytime you see Bond, you could hear that Bond theme because it's James Bond's theme. And it's a fantastic. Theme. Isn't it? Yeah. It's like, well, it's just, I, I it's, it's goose pump. It's goose pimple bumps on your arm when you think about it, right? At least I do, right? I mean, you can probably, you probably can't see them on camera. Anyway, um, <laughs> it's, it's tremendous. It's just like it's oh my god, Vic Flick. You know he deserves all the credit for coming up with that that guitar theme, right? Yeah, yeah. Just right, right. and it's been morphed a bit and tweaked and all that stuff down the road. Yeah. Um, but it's incredible, and you it cannot be overstated. Uh, well, and and like the you importance said, of that 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 song that was established in Doctor Who that music. Yeah. yeah, you're saying you know they play the theme when you see Bond. They've done that with some other characters then throughout, like Diamonds, right? Went and Kid got their own music. Yeah, 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 mm-hmm. yeah. Right. It's kind of well, cool when they do that. It's they've like they've done stuff of, like that. Do, in, in, do, 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 yeah, do, they've do, done stuff do, like that in many shows and movies. <laughs> I mean, even uh, Andy Griffith show Barney had his own Barney Fife. He had his own music. <laughs> you know, so I mean, they've done this for a long time, but it's pretty cool and. How they use music in the Bond movies, I mean, geez, if you stripped out the music and watched the movie, it certainly would not be as rich as as watching it with the music and hearing the music. Because, like you said, Morgan, 
you just identify it's like an advertising campaign with certain musics and jingles that you identify with the product that's what we do we identify it with bond whenever we hear it and boom you gotta love it anything else well, actually, uh, going back on, um, I can't remember the person's name who was talking earlier about about the music giving you, you know, goosebumps. Uh, um, Morgan, yeah, it's Morgan. Yeah. Okay, um, I feel the same way uh, because uh, you know um, through YouTube, I was able to get as much music as possible from all the Bond films, from Doctor No all the way to No Time to Die. Wow. So it's like a playlist of seventy five songs that I have from all the Bond movies. <laughs> That's like my, my, my inspiration when I have to get up to go to work in the morning, getting ready in the bathroom. And <laughs> my, my wife is sick and tired of listening to Bond song. <laughs> like, like, can you play something else? Does it have to be the same music all the time? I said, inspirational. I said, even in my, even in the car, I had uh, the theme song from Honor Majesty's Secret Service. You know, I love playing oh, that when I'm one. on the road. Yeah. I, I love, I love playing that song when I'm on the road. It's just, it inspires you, and um, you know the. It's not just the music that inspires you. I mean, it's 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 everything. You know, like clothing. Like, how many other movies or characters of a movie do you know of? Well, maybe like Star Wars could be different, but I mean, like James Bond movies, people dress up in tuxedos yeah. just to go watch the movie. And I thought that was just during the Goldfinger Thunderball days, but I mean, even during the Daniel Craig period, yeah, people were yeah. wearing tuxedos going to watch his movies, and other movies don't have that type of effect. Yeah, um, you know, unless you're doing cosplay for Marvel or DC or Star Wars, right, 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 but yeah, uh, yeah. you got a yeah, or something. It's terrific how they've had an impact virtually in everything, and like you said, with the clothing. I mean, just the clothes he wore. <laughs> you're looking at these. Doctor No for the first time, and you're seeing this guy who's impeccably dressed. As we get now, we're going to talk about Bond, James Bond, the introduction of him, right? We don't know who this guy is. It's a nice slow reveal in Doctor No. We don't know anything really about Bond yet. This is our first movie, and it's got to be the best introduction of a main character that you can possibly have. And the slow reveal was terrific. And Ian Productions just did a spectacular job on this one. Yeah, he's not Jimmy Bond, played by Barry Nelson in the made-for-TV movie Casino Royale 1954. No, yeah. this is Bond, James Bond. And, yeah, it's, and, it's, it's, it's definitely, in my opinion anyway, the most iconic uh, opening in the history. It uh, is. No, nothing comes close to it. And, and yeah, you, you don't see Bond at this stage. You see Sylvia Trench, you know, and she's playing cards with him and he's he's winning every hand right and she, i admire your courage mr and i admire your luck mr and then he just lays into yeah, it and, yeah. stuff, and it blows up his nose and all that stuff and you got the, the the bond theme again in the background right it's just incredible it's it's more goosebumps right yeah. it's just <laughs> yeah Oh, yeah. no, and I, I got to just make a comment here morgan you're <laughs> definitely a bond fan because star wars fans might argue that the scroll at the beginning of Star Wars is the most iconic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're wrong. <laughs> they're wrong. Exactly. They're uh, wrong. I agree. They're wrong. <laughs> yeah, they're wrong. Uh, so this scene, uh, I um, mean... Uh, what, I, what I love about the casino scene between Sylvia Trench and um, James Bond is the fact that um, Sylvia Trench also introduces herself as yes. Trench. Yes. Sylvia mm. Trench. She sets it off. Uh, uh, before, so it sets it up because if he just said Bond, James Bond before that line became iconic, it may have been a bit pretentious. But the fact that she says it, yes, he's mimicking right. her, so yes. she actually sets it all up Perfect. for going forwards. Yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this this scene and and actually in real life when they were filming this, Sean Connery had a problem saying Bond, James Bond. He was getting it all confused. He was saying Connery, James James Connery, Bond this. And so they, they I think they said, go take him out for a drink. And, and I think they actually had a couple of drinks, Sylvia Trench, Eunice Gason, and Sean. And then he came back and bam, Bond, James Bond. Just perfect, he did it. So that's great. This scene really at the Ambassador Casino in London, Tom and I got to the doorstep of that building and mm. saw the sign. You can't go in because it's all private and stuff like that, but they let us take pictures there and stuff. That was kind of cool. That's kind of fun. I mean, 
man, it, it, you couldn't have made this better, right? And we're getting introduced to this whole casino idea too with Bond and the tuxedo and him looking impeccable and cool because he's winning at the table. <laughs> Everything he's doing, you're like, ooh, ooh, ooh. he's like, ah, God, that's terrific. So, well, he tips the doorman as yeah. he's leaving. Yeah, and that's it's so easy to I miss think. that. Well, the, the other thing about this is it's an interesting juxtaposition with the books because in the novels, I believe it's M that has the club membership, right? So, the ambassador is supposed to be kind of like, yeah, his blades or whatever. But here, Bond's in there, M's nowhere around, so it's like Bond's in this place, but it's not. You know, the, the, the club thing and where the gambling happens in the books, a lot of that's actually at M's club, not yeah. somewhere else. So in Blades. They, yeah, yeah, yeah right, Blades. Right. So yeah. How, they, how they juxtapose that between the two. And I think this really makes a good start because it's the suave, debonair Bond walking around by himself yeah. making, making his Bond, James Bond. Yeah, the adaptation is, is sensational, yeah. uh, you know, and... Uh, the way they, I mean, because you have the books, which are great books, yeah. but there's a little bit more low key, you know, down to earth, gritty. Yes. And whereas on the screen, you want to be entertained. So they have to sort of embellish it a bit and change yeah. it around. And, you know, because you get the value in front of you on the screen. And, um, you yeah, know, they did a fabulous job of the way they adapt it to yeah. the screen and make it a little bit larger than life. And the other thing that more. happens in this scene, too, is that he's sitting there kind of cool and winning taking all of Sylvia Trench's money, basically, as she keeps writing checks for more. But he's he's calm and cool the whole time. But then he gets this mysterious message delivered to him. And we see constantly in the rest of the Bond movies where he's going to get a message, right? He's, he's making love with a woman in Austria or whatever, and here comes the, his watch, his tape watch saying, you know, call him or whatever. And constantly doing that. Where's Bond? Tell him to pull out. Okay. <laughs> I mean, constantly from this point forward, he's going to get these kinds of messages, and we are always wondering, what's going on? What's he going to have to do now? I mean, this is just perfection. You could not have had, I don't think, a better introduction to James Bond. This is just and we perfect. never see the guy, the guy that hands the card yes. to, to the guy to give to Bond. We never see him again. That's it. That's no. this whole scene. No, right. that's that's it. It. You figured he, he would meet up and say, what's going on here? It, right? MD, you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah, the poor guy credited in the movie. I want to know who he was because I mean, he looked pretty stylish too. You know, he had yes. his hair combed real nicely. He's very well dressed and it's like, he looked pretty suave and debonair also. And poor guy didn't even get a credit in the movie. Yeah. And <laughs> I confidence never got himself. Credit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so the, I, the, another thing about this, Dan, you, you had made the comment about how, they had to take Sean out for a cocktail or three to, be, to get this line right. When you hear the, the successive actors who've played Bond, they talk about the tension mm. of trying to get that line right for the first time. Yeah, the first I can't movie, imagine. Trying to get that because this is so iconic. Yeah. And, you know, and then again with Daniel Craig, they wait till the end of the damn movie to, they yeah. end it with it, which is so stupid. Yeah. But, uh, he actually delivered it well. But, yeah, uh, just, yeah. But he actually it, it, kind of smirks, too, when he delivers it. Yeah. Because he knows he's got the better of white. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, really, well, nothing know, else, I don't think, since any uh, in any other movie really has come close to this complete mm -hmm. perfection of an introduction of a character. Well, you know, the, uh, the, the the only thing close, I know I know, it was based off of another movie. I had read that that introduction yeah, was... So Juarez. Juarez, right? Yes. Yep. But you know, if you watch, if you watch Notorious with Cary Grant, yes, it's yeah. very similar as well. You only see him from the back when he's at the party. Yep, and um, then his face is shown later, not as dramatic as Sean Connery, but you know, very similar. So yeah. I wonder if maybe there was a little bit of influence from that movie as well. I think it was. That's a, that's think a good point. Was. That's yeah. a good point. We just recorded uh, our episode on Notorious, and we actually talked about that, Eric. We actually oh. see that you're right. On. We haven't released it yet, so it's not like you missed it yet. It's, yeah, it's, right. It's, it's, it's not released yet. Can. All right. Yeah, so, right. yeah but it's thing. really so. My understanding is Juarez influenced. They, they reference Juarez when they talk about the influence of the slow reveal, mm. but then Juarez did influence Notorious. It's so close to the same concept that you got to believe it. And the other thing with this is, since Fleming was a big smoker, yep. Bond smoking a cigarette as he's doing that. And when they move over to George Lazenby, 
he's he lights a cigarette up in as they're starting to do his slow reveal. Mm -hmm. um, they get away from that going mm -hmm. forward, but it's it's kind of interesting how that uh, yeah the that later was something they, they were trying smoke. to bring forward, but then with the way society has changed, they stopped. Yeah, but, right, exactly. But the slow reveal was was perfect, and then. The other thing is the introduction of the other main characters that we're going to see in many more James Bond movies and the introduction of minor characters who play big roles. So first we'll talk about, of course, the main characters. We've got M, of course, and Money Penny, and Boothroyd, who becomes Q, basically, <laughs> and Felix Leiter we see for the first time here in Dr. No. And we're going to see him, obviously, in more Bond films. And... Uh, his CIA friend for life, basically, uh, you know, literally <laughs> till the end. <laughs> uh, and then the minor characters, the main character, Boothroyd with the, you're not using the Beretta anymore. You know, nice and light for a lady's handbag. <laughs> mm -hmm. You're using the Walter PPK. All of that stuff is new to us, but we're thinking, wow, this is kind of cool. You know, mm -hmm. now the thing well, is, yeah, what, they, what they, I like. Go okay. ahead. Now, all I was going to say, what I like about that scene is because in the because they've taken that from the book, Doctor No, mm -hmm. that followed on from from Russia with Love, which is the other way around from the movie series. Yes. And, and because there, um, um, it just didn't work. Whereas here, they take that. We don't need any backstory, but we just know he's getting a new gun and they're setting it all up, yeah. and it all makes sense with, within the film. That's what I was, and that's what I just like about that scene. Yeah, and yeah, it's it's a great switch because uh, you know Fleming himself had Bond using the the Smith and Wesson with a skeleton grip, and before the real major booth where it said, "Hey, Bond really shouldn't be that's the ladies' gun. Kind of he should probably you know upgrade. You know, the Walter PPK is the gun he should go to, and so they switched to that yeah. in the novel, Doctor No. So they found okay, that's appropriate. Let's put a little bit of background in the movie. You used the Beretta for, ten, well, it was a Beretta this time. Yep. You've used it for 10 years and never missed with it, yada, yada. Yeah. And uh, maybe not a jammed on you last time. You spent six months in the hospital in consequence. You know, you carry a double, it means you're licensed to kill. That's a great introduction right there, too. Yes. And it ties it with the gun and all that stuff. It's beautiful. Yeah, and the interesting thing, like you just said, Morgan, he said, I've used it for 10 years. I mean, we have no idea this is the first movie we're seeing for Bond. We have no idea how long he's been in her majesty's secret service really but he's been using this gun for 10 years now you're, you're kind of wondering and i i every time he says that i'm wondering how, how long has this guy been in this <laughs> you know, it's like wow <laughs> mm -hmm. you know this is pretty good and they let him get away with a beretta for 10 years i think it was a beretta 418 i think a 418 mm -hmm. all right yeah, they, the other thing too with with the with the the way they did this with the scene with boothroyd and with them yeah about the gun they mimic that in the Ipris fight with Harry, where he, they give him a, I forget which, which model's gun. Yes, Harry right. Palmer. Yeah, but they made him switch, and he preferred his old one. Yeah. And it was it was almost line for line, it seemed, between the two movies. But so it's it's not only that this this character went forward in the Bond series of Boothroyd, you had a similar kind of thing take into the Ipcris file, which was another Harry Salzman produced movie. Mm. Well, well, yeah, Harry Salzman produced all those uh, mid sixties yeah, uh, Harry, Harry Palmer movies. The three films, yeah. yeah, yeah, a lot of Bond connections in the Ipcris file, actually. And let, let's look at some of the minor characters too. The introduction of minor characters here, nonetheless, they play big roles. And this is the first iteration of Doctor No. So this will become the staple, really, in the in the movies to come. We're going to see these characters. Like in Dr. No, we see the three blind mice. Well, from the title sequence to the Queen's private club, which again gives us this concept of a private club and so on, to murdering Strangways, chasing Bond, the first car chase in the movie and more, these little three guys, even though they're minor characters, play a hell of a role in the movie. And Strangways, Tim Moxon, he was uncredited, I believe, for this. And his secretary, Mary Trueblood, who was Dolores Keeter, she actually owned the house that was supposedly Strangway's house in Jamaica. They're the reason Bond is in Jamaica. And they're on screen for, I don't know, maybe a minute or so, right? But they play a big role also. So this is kind of mm -hmm. cool. And even Sylvia Trench, you know, she uh, does appear again in From Russia with Love, but she's a major minor character who... <laughs> 
who introduces a whole thing of, of Bond James Bond, right? So that's pretty cool. And then you got Xena Marshall as Mistero and so on. All these minor characters play big roles, and you see that forever now in James Bond films, that these minor characters have this deep connection in the movie now, and it's kind of cool. Even the photographer, you know, <laughs> and so yeah, on. The freelance, yeah. Yeah, the freelance. I'm a freelance photographer. I think Marguerite <laughs> Loire is her name is, and yes, she's a minor minor role, really. But again, I love the way she licked the ball after yeah. she took the picture. That is yes. just we, we mentioned that in our <laughs> Doctor agree. No One. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, what do you think? You also want to throw anything in about these minor characters who play big roles? Well, Bernard Lee, first of all, perfect casting as him. Absolutely love him. The best M ever, no question, hands down, no, no competition there. Yeah. And Lois Maxwell, great Canadian actress. Yes. You know, she went to Rada with Roger Moore and all that stuff, and uh, she was perfect as Money Penny, you know? Yeah. She wasn't the stunning knockout. She was a very pretty lady, efficient secretary, mm-hmm. you, know, she, you know, keeping Bond kind of in check in a ways, right? You know? And the interplay between the two it was fun. It was light. It was entertaining. Yeah. And, of course, you know, Q... Well, Major Boothroyd in, the, in, in Doctor No, there wasn't really much interplay. It wasn't until the next film that we started that, started to see that. And uh, so, no, those are our iconic characters because they, their bonds match. They're with him, right? They're his supporting cast around him. Yep. So those those players are very, very important to building a uh, continuity throughout the rest of the films, right? You, of course you see Bond, but you want to see M, you want to see Monty Penny, yeah. you want to see Q. Q. Every time Desmond Llewellyn came on screen, it just made me smile because I just lo- I loved it every time he appeared on screen because he was just a terrific Q. Now, you mentioned Bernard Lee, right? I think you mentioned. Yeah. 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 I mean, I was Bernard. just watching uh, Secret Agent, which is Danger Man Secret Agent with uh, Patrick McEwen. Bernard Lee was in that as his boss, kind of playing an M character. This was like the third season, like one of the last shows. So it's like, hey, it's M. And he was playing an M-type character in that in that show. That was pretty cool. That's a great series, by the way. I do have one pet peeve about Bernard Lee, is that he appeared as uh, in um, Operation Kid Brother. With <laughs> uh, Maxwell. And I, and both Maxwell. Both of them were in that movie, and uh, that pissed off Sean Connery so so much that they, first of all that they would make put his his brother in a in a bond in a bond spoof like that yeah, yeah. and I guess as an actor you need the money you want to keep working and all that stuff yeah, but I would yeah. find, oh wait a minute I'm M in the real bond series with yeah. the real James Bond I'm not going to do this movie but they did, he did it anyway and same with Lois Maxwell yeah. so a bit I, right. I wanted to kind of, I want to kind of go back to the minor characters part. Yeah, so we have yeah. the we have the minor recurring characters, which are the Q and the M and stuff. But then, like you were talking about these other minor characters who played big roles. If you think about most movies you can think through, what other movies do you sit there and say, "Yeah, I remember that girl. She licked the light bulbs." Now, the reason she did that was for conductivity. It was actually a fairly common practice. Yeah, back then with those with the bulbs. Yeah, but. But it looks sexual. It looks what other sexy. what other movie do you think of where you can name six other characters that were yeah. on screen for less than a minute? Yeah, but had an impact. Yeah, this series does do that. It. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. I mean, even a great movie Most like North by Northwest, it'd be yeah. hard to come up with two or three others, yeah. right? It's like, yeah, oh, can't do it, All right? Superman, Superman, yes, yeah, super. okay, yes, Superman. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Superman, that's good. Yep. We also get introduced here to MI6 operations, of course, and we see them for the first time here trying to reestablish contact here with their operatives in Jamaica, which is the reason Bond is going down to Jamaica. And we see M's office, and, man, that's pretty cool. And, and how well appointed it is. All of these things are for the first time we're seeing here. And, of course, we're going to see it over and over again. M even brings his office on the living daylights on the plane. <laughs> if you remember. Yeah. He's got statuettes yeah. and all that kind of stuff there. It's like, oh, man, that's really okay, M. Uh, yeah, you're seeing them on the big screen as they're re-releasing them. Yes, I've been yeah. 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 Oh, Dr. You know, on the that here in Canada, yeah, uh, that, that setup hasn't arrived, and I'm just so 
best off. That it's not. It's there in the UK where they're you know re-releasing these all, but they're not doing it over here yet. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, I'd, I'd be I'd be annoyed as well um, because Doctor No on the big screen is really. I mean, they're all really good, but I think Doctor No and Live and Let Die out of all the ones that I've seen, mm-hmm. they've really better than they are on TV. You know, oh my god, they've really gone up. They've extreme. really gone up a notch. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so is uh, Honor Majesty Secret Service. That's a fabulous one on the big screen. That's a great mm-hmm. one. Yeah, yeah, actually, uh, la- last year, in fe- uh, February last year, the Cinemark Theaters, uh, last year in February, they uh, played Dr. No on the big screen. And even though my son and I have seen it hundreds of times, <laughs> we still saw it anyway. And it, it, it's such a big difference. Yeah. It's, it's such, I mean, it, just seeing it larger than life on the big screen, it's yeah. enjoyable experience. So. And that's really what what Cubby and Salzman did. I mean, they wanted they, that's what they said. They're going to spend a lot of money. Or they're going to put it all on the screen, and they do. And everything mm-hmm. is so fabulous with the way they do it. So now we're talking about on screen. So we could talk about James Bond's on screen character here being developed for the first time here in Doctor No. Of course, there's always differences between the novels that Ian Fleming wrote and the movies, and there's connections and disconnections sometimes but with sean connery now we see the on-screen james bond being developed he's cocky self-assured his attitude winning at the casino and so on uh his interaction with sylvia trench after they leave the table where he's like yeah call me here's my card you know my number's on the card you know? <laughs> it's, like, oh. it's like okay this guy's cool and and all of that the whole concept tuxedos, the gambling, the women, everything, all really packed right up front in that movie. And these are the kinds of things now that will develop over all the rest of the movies. And he never gets flustered there, right? Although, uh, he, he, I mean, James Bond does get, get afraid and, and so on, and other parts of movies and so on. But here you see him again, just confident and cocky, even at the government house when he's with Miss Taro, you know, it's like, uh, she's got the afternoon off. Show me around the town. Well, maybe, maybe they'll see me at my hotel. Maybe, well, maybe I will. <laughs> maybe a three. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> it's like the guy's mm-hmm. just cool. And here we see it developing all now. Now we're thinking we're going to expect this forever. And we kind of get that. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Well, you know, from, from my understanding, you know, from, from what I've read, and I'm sure all of you have read it as well, was that, you know, they were saying that before Dr. No, you know, a lot of the British movies were these kitchen sink dramas, these black and whites, you know, that, you know, told good stories, but it wasn't larger than life like James Bond. Mm. All of a sudden you got this big colorful movie with these interesting characters and they're traveling to different parts of the world. Well, they only went to Jamaica. But, um, you know, I, I think for audiences back in 1962, that was a big deal. That was an eye opener. That was like, oh, my God, this is fantastic, something they've never seen before. So I think that's also part of the allure of why James Bond just became so popular was because it was so different from anything that audiences, whether it was from the U.K. or the U.S. or Canada, they've never seen anything like that before. Yeah. Right. And, okay. you know, I I would agree with that um, because at at the time, you know, um, because it's only been, what, about 16, 17 years after the Second World War, um, rationing had only been, had only stopped about seven years earlier. So going just to, from the UK, this is, Mm. going to France was was going to cost a lot. As for going to Jamaica, well, forget it, you know, it's, um, it's like going to the moon today. But... But um, but seeing it on the big screen, yes. um, you know, it just opened everything up. And that's the reason why I think they put the James Bond theme in um, at the Jamaican airport, just to sh- because it's massive. Yeah. It's right. a massive scene. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah I like mean, you it, said. It takes you away to tropical paradises and things that the audiences are not familiar with. And so it's that escapism yeah. for two hours. It just love it. Yeah, you were jet setting around in 1962, the average person. So you're you're not seeing Jamaica, you're not seeing these exotic places. So yeah, that's true. That's a good point. And then we're developing his on screen character, and we see the quips and so on and so on, like he's talking to 
to Dr. No, who doesn't really appear until like an hour and 24 minutes into the movie, which is kind of like, wow, that's kind of cool. Joseph Wiseman did such a great job <laughs> with such little screen time. And mm-hmm. you know, when he's quipping with him about Spectre, you know, it's like, you know, well, sign me up for the revenge department for, uh, I like to find out who killed, you know, <laughs> Strangways and Quarrel. It's like, okay, mm. that's cool. And then he quipped about uh, Dr. No's hands. You know, was it worth it using your, losing your hands over interfering with American missiles? <laughs> he's like, man. <laughs> and the fish tank, the fish tank one. I love that one, right? Minnows mm-hmm. pretending to be whales like you, Dr. No, on this island. It's like, oh, man, you can't get cooler. <laughs> you know, you think, all people also, think that Napoleon or God. Oh, yes. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <clears throat> mm-hmm. and, you know, even, even Dr. No's entrance was iconic because, you know, the first time we actually see him was when he went to Bond's bedroom. Yes. And the door opens and you just saw that long shadow. Yep. And I think even that's been imitated, I think, on, I can't remember which cartoon. It was like Simpsons or something, one of them. Mm. You know, they even yeah. imitated doing that sort of thing, uh, you know, with Dr. No coming in. And uh, we really didn't see his face until, like you said, when, yeah. when Honey and yeah. Bond were looking at the uh, at the aquarium at the fish. And yeah, then we finally get to see his face. Yeah. That's, I think that's you see his, uh, his steel hand, though, when he walks into Bond's room. Yeah, you see right. his feet with the white shoes. Yeah. Like yeah, good, pretty good stuff. So we see another another character characteristic to being developed here: how tough he is. Right, he's not afraid to mix it up in a fight with the driver from the airport, Jones, he, and he fights with him. Pussfeller at the bar, and mm-hmm. we'll see this virtually in every Bond movie that he, he's not afraid to get in there with his fists if he has to. And we learn that Bond deals with deaths of his enemies kind of casually like Jones in the car <laughs> and leaving him there with the government house, make sure he doesn't get away or whatever and mm-hmm. killing Dent. Uh, that was a big deal when mm-hmm. he shot Dent, right? Unarmed and yeah. shoots him twice. The second shot was a big discussion, I think for the movie. Well, right Yeah. Around. I mean, we've never seen an agent who has a license to kill. To kill. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He's not a policeman. He can kill anyone he wants to. Mm-hmm. He has a license to kill, and that was totally unique and new. Yep. We had never seen that on the screen before. It was in the books, of course. Yes. But. Yep. Um, yeah. No, I, 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 I was speaking to someone on, fa- on Facebook about that scene yesterday or the day before, and, um, and uh, apparently there was a lot of discussion in making that scene because the thing is, is first of all, um, he shoots an unarmed man. Mm-hmm. Um, but secondly, he shoots um, him in the back, and that is very un-British yeah. and uh, and very unheroic. It's not what you would expect the hero mm. to do. Yeah. So it was the producer's way to show he's he has got a cruel, sadistic side to him. Yes. Um, and it was a way of demonstrating it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it does it so quickly, and you're you're really you're thrown back by it, going. Wow, <laughs> this guy's one bad dude, <laughs> man. So well, it's interesting to me too, though. If you think about today versus back then, mm-hmm. right? How uh, I'm going to use the word shocking, and that, that's that's overkill on that. That would be to an audience in '62. Now there is so much violence in movies that you t- uh, somebody coming up today seeing that for the first time would not have that same no. reaction. Oh, that's yeah. true. That's true. But, the, you other, know, the other thing I want to make about this, you were talking about he, he's not afraid to mix it up. Yeah. He often doesn't win his fights. Yeah. <laughs> when he's in fisticuffs, he often doesn't win them. Like even the one with Pussfeller, he didn't yeah. really win that because you know, lighter shows up. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, he got the better of him. He had the gun on him. but <laughs> Yeah, but he didn't win because lighter shows up and – yeah, I think there's another great line there is like, I hope he's better at cooking than alligator wrestling, you know. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, no one ever died for my food. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. uh, so all all good stuff. And we we see we do see a softer side of Bond that for the first time, and you don't see it often in the movies, but you see it a couple of times in the movies. And here where he kind of walks over to Quarrel's body after he gets burned up by the dragon, right? He kind of he he's going over there out of respect to because he did like Coral. That was his buddy there now. 
that he just got to know, but it's his buddy. And so you saw that there. So you, we do see it a, a few times in the future as well. But here again, it sets the pace that we're going to see sometimes this little bit of a soft side of Bond where he is empathetic. And, and in the books, you do see that too as yeah. well. So, and of course, we see his attitude towards women developing here. <laughs> this could go on for two hours with with just that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, somewhat respecting and somewhat not respecting and treating them the way he has to to get his mission done. I think the thing is that nothing is going to stand in the way of Bond's mission. He's going to do his mission. And whoever and whatever he has to do to get there, he's going to do. And we're going to have a, a video coming out on that as well. But you got you got to give Bond credit, though. He does go back and save Honey Rider. He didn't have to, you know. Mm -hmm. So we, we see here for the first time he's going to go save the person that he's been involved with during the and during the mission. So that was kind of cool that he went back and saved Honey Rider. And he enda literally endangering his own life and his future, really, with... MI6 and so on as an agent, right? right. But saving well, the damsel he's in also the hero. He's the hero, right? So he's got to save the girl. He's got to save the day, including the girl. Yeah. And they established that nicely in Doctrine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and again, you know, the, in Miss Taro, he, in her place, he grabs her and kisses her. And there's a few quips that he he throws on her there as well. So, and Miss Trench, of course, as we said, well, he's got to leave immediately. Well, almost immediately, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I love how they, that's a, that's one of those quips that they've brought forward in future Bond movies, and I love it. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. yeah and I'm I'm with the woman. I've, I've got to leave. Well, during well, daylights, yeah. Tim Dalton, yeah. Timothy Dalton yeah. does that on the boat when the woman on the boat. I, I, I like that when they do that. And now we see the the interplay with Money Penny too. You, you never take me to dinner. Uh, illegal use of government property. Uh, Bond says whatever. It's like whoa. And I I love that scene where he's kind of getting close to her and cuddling up with his face right next to her and kisses her on the forehead kind of thing. It's like, woo, man. And then, of course, he's here, him saying, hey, none of your regular repertoire, uh, money funny, you know, let it, he's bronze in a hurry, you know. <laughs> let him go. Uh, so we see that for the first time, and that goes on forever. And that people got to love, right? Everyone loved that relationship between Bond and Money Penny as it went forward, including the the wedding, really, when he gets married and she is all in tears with the hat and it was like, oh, she looked great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on Her Majesty's Secret Service. But he, he does establish his womanizing ways, though, here in Dr. No, and that continues for most, really, most of the series. A point on the womanizing, don't yeah. forget he's he's deals with the evil women, right? So we're not too concerned about his morals when he's dealing with someone he knows is the bad person. That's the true. enemy. That's true. We're okay with that. Yeah, we're okay with that. And I think that's the whole thing with uh, Fleming when he said he didn't intend for Bond to be likable. That doesn't mean we can't like him, but <laughs> because we're on his side, we're, we're really always on Bond's side, right? We want him to succeed and be the hero that kind of Fleming went back and forth, whether he is a hero or not a hero Bond, but we're always on Bond's side, so yeah, we do kind of say, okay, yeah, no, she's a she's bad, so that's that's fine, whatever. <laughs> it's gotta do. <laughs> if, you, if you look at uh, um, Bond's relationship with Honey, I mean, at the beginning, when when um, she says, oh, "Oh, are you looking for for shells too?" and Bond says, "No, I'm just looking." <laughs> but throughout the rest of the film, he does actually treat her with respect. You know, he's not always trying to jump into bed with her. Absolutely. He does treat her with respect throughout throughout the throughout the right. film. Yes, outside of that initial yeah um, meeting right. point. Well, you know the scene the scene when they were sitting together and he was I think he was cleaning his gun yeah. and Honey yeah. was explaining, you know, why she was in Jamaica that. You know uh, the 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 landlord took yeah. advantage of her. You know I think he sympathize he he's, he sympathized with her because she had gone through you know yeah. losing her father. Uh, some older guy took advantage of her, yeah. and you know she responded by was it Black Widow Spider or uh, you know. So I, I think Female. he symp Bond <laughs> sympathized with Honey. So you know that's why I think he had some emotional attachment to her. 
um, from that little scene. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think he did respect her too, because she stood up for herself with the, with the black widow spider, the, who took the weak guy a week to die. She said, <laughs> and she said did I do wrong? And Bond's like, well, it wouldn't be good to make a habit of this, but you know, it's like, okay. <laughs> yeah, that was a good scene. And, and so, yeah, I think you're right. He does treat her with respect and, and Bond is a resourceful guy, right? He, in Crab Key, they needed to breathe underwater. Boom, cut cut the reeds there. Now, he was a little abrupt with Quarrel and directing him to do things. Fetch my shit, right. do this, cover the boat, yeah. cover the boat, Fetch I'll be down there. The you know, it's like, what? <laughs> Aren't you helping covering the boat? <laughs> but uh, but it, he, he is resourceful, right? Cut the reeds, breathe underwater while those guys are doing it. And then we see him kill the guy in the water, too, with the knife. No problem for him. I had to do it, he said. And he just mm-hmm. lets him go float. And so now we get used to this now because we've seen all these other Bond movies. But here again, setting the pace for us in Dr. No and how this guy's going to think and what he's got to do to get his mission done. That's kind of cool. Yeah, he's got, he's got a license to kill, right? We established that, and he uses that. Yep. He has to. He has no choice. Yeah, yeah. Resourceful in the in the in the, uh, in the resort as well with the talcum potter on the briefcase and the hair on the on the cabinet to make sure nobody went in there or whatever. Now people would look at that going, "This is your technology." It's like, well, <laughs> <laughs> I love that old school stuff. That hair on the like, oh. <laughs> hey. that's right out of the book, though, right? Yep. The, the yeah. Hair on the... Yep. That, but that's the thing I do like about this film because it's the first film. You do see him doing him and MI six doing real spy things like the hair, you know. Mm. That's a, I suppose that's a real spy thing, I would imagine, or maybe, or certainly in the nineteen sixties. And also at the be- way at the beginning with Strangways, we see MI six tracking it through because you see you see all the yes, um, you know all the. The MI six people, um, you know, at the radio controls, trying to uh, trying to reestablish contact and then pulling it and everything. So, so it was nice for once just to see because I'm guessing this happens all the time, but we don't see it. And if we see it in every film, it would get boring. Yes. But just to see it in that first film, it was actually nice. Yeah, all right. We also see Bond is pretty well trained. I mean, we saw him do with the hair thing and the talcum powder thing and so on, but he also checked out Mr. Jones, right, ahead of time at the airport. He called the government house, see if they sent the driver, found out now, nah, didn't send the driver. When he's pouring a drink in his room later on, he, like, smells the bottle and, like, mm, no, takes a fresh bottle, pours himself mm-hmm. a drink from the fresh bottle. So you're seeing, okay, he's kind of well trained in doing what he has to do. Now, Trust to verify. Some, sometimes he's lucky, like the three blind mice could should have shot him when he was outside the, was it the government house? No. The, the hotel. The hotel, when mm-hmm. another car came by, whatever, and they had to abandon their plan. So he lucked out there. And so we're going to mm-hmm. see, hey, a lot of times we're going to see luck play out in Bond's favor in other movies as well. Right. But we know, like you've been saying, he's got a license to kill, and he is a cold-blooded killer. When he kills... He doesn't really regret it all that much. In the books, he's a little softer about killing. I know he's not thrilled about killing in the books, but he does it, and he does what he has to do. But here it's, you know, he's he's brutal. He's, <laughs> he's tough. And we see that later on in, in other Bond movies as well, with Roger Moore as Bond kicking Loke over. Yeah. Well, well, Roger Moore, I think, sums yeah, it look, up. Yeah, and, um, the spy who the... loved me when when he's talking to Anya and she says, "Did you kill my boyfriend?" Yeah. And he says, "Well, when you're um, um, going down a mountain on skis and people are shooting at you, yeah. it's kill or be killed." Yep. Right. Yep. You know, and that really sums it up. Yep. It does, yeah. and that's that's how he thinks, and that's okay with him, and. That's how he survives, and, and as we see for the rest of the Bond franchise, that's how he survives until he doesn't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we also see here for the first time Bond's knowledge of the fine things in life, right? We're not used to this. We're watching a movie in 1962. You know, most people aren't drinking Dom Perignon. And I love it when he's going to crack the guard over the head with a bottle of 56. I think it was 56, Tom Pernio. And, and Dr. No says, that's a 
1956 Dom Perignon, you know, I wouldn't be doing that. <laughs> buying It'd comedy. be a pity to waste it. Com- <laughs> yeah, it's a way- and Bond Comley says, sounds as I prefer the 53 myself. <laughs> <It's> like, mm-hmm. <laughs> I think it was a 55 that yeah, I had. He's I prefer the 53 myself. It's like, wow, come on. <laughs> so we're, we're getting this feeling now, too. And the same thing with the vodka martinis now introduced for us. He's gotten it shaken, not stirred with a lemon peel. It's like, okay, man, all of these things that are iconic are all happening here for the first time. But if, ahead, if on, on this, if again, as we were saying earlier, if you go back to 1962, UK just come out five years earlier, having come out of rationing, you know, a Dom Perignon um, would have been, you know, way out of people's reach. Yes. Um, you know, vodka martinis would have been. And so these, even though they might seem like you just go to a pub and order a vodka martini normally today, and it doesn't seem a big deal, it probably was yes. a big oh, deal, what? as big as going to Jamaica, probably. I... And I'm sure any historian watching this might now correct me. Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. And then we finally see the establishing tropes that we're going to see over and over again, right? The Walter PPK, exotic locations, Bond girls, of course, we're going to see and everything, and the very first car chase. Yes, uh, yeah. Bond That's is right. driving, right? His Sunbeam Al- car chase, Dan, not the first car chase in any movie. First, first car one. chase in a Bond movie. We see here as Bond is driving his Sunbeam Alpine Series 2 car, which <laughs> it seemed like the car of the future for Bond, but... The first car chase where the hearse is chasing him with the three blind mice. So all, all of this stuff is happening here. And, of course, we see Dr. No, the first, a word I have a hard time saying, megalomaniacal. Is that right? <laughs> a megalomaniac. A megalomaniac. That's better. Dr. No. A science, yeah. uh, you know, a, a bright science has gone bad. And so it kind of defines the supervillains uh, that we'll see in many of the Bond movies to come as well. And Joseph Wiseman did a great job for, like we said, so little screen time. He was evil and menacing and and powerful and cocky. Great. World domination, like you said earlier. Oh, the same old thing. <laughs> it's like our asylums are full of these people. All right. And and- you're, you're, t- you're talking about these chases, right? And I'm going to... It, think about the rear projection used in that ch- in the chase. Yes, yes, in Doctor No, and how bad that was. Yes, and they carry that badness forward when they started using CGI. It's like they they, they didn't know how to use these technologies, but wanted to introduce them into these movies. <laughs> yeah. me up. Hey, Pietro, you had something? So, Pietro's sorry, Tom. I, 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 I don't want to disagree with you or show off that I've just seen Dr. No on the big screen again. Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't want to show off or anything, but, <laughs> but I agree with you. Every time I watch, every time I've seen Dr. No on TV, I would agree with you. Having watched the 4K remastered version on the big screen, th- those car chases actually look, I mean, they do still look a bit dated, but they actually look a lot better than they do on okay. on um, on the TV. Hey, you know, at the time in 62, that was the technology. That's, yeah. that's all that was yeah. out there, right? You didn't see anything better. There was nothing better happening in movie oh, theaters true. than that. That was the best that they, you know, they put all the money into it, right? It's the mm-hmm. best technology they had at the time. Right. All right. Well, I'll, I'll give you that. They, they sure blew it with CGI, though. Yeah, this CGI crap from the Brazen movies. Oh, Another trope we see is, of course, sex and violence becoming the standard in previous movies because of motion picture standards and laws and rules and so on. You didn't see that kind of stuff like the 39 Steps, Secret Agent, Man Who Knew Too Much, North by Northwest, Silent M. All these things were like, they they were were softened. The, The risque stuff was in the background, basically. But Dr. No kind of took a new approach here and brought it forward on screen and certainly the violence and a little bit in the Honey Rider thing at the end when they're in the little boat there together. It's kind of fun. So that's another big deal. And, of course, the sets, the huge sets. This is 
the standard now for Bond movies, right? Here we see mm -hmm. Dr. Nose Lair for the first time, and it's a huge, fabulous set. Yeah, the scene where Dent comes during the day violating the strictest rules and he's sitting in that room and there's just a chair in the yeah. corner. Nothing else. You don't see anything else. And you see the the oval-shaped yes. grate in the ceiling, right? It, and it just looks, wow. It's, it's like, super, like supernatural. Not even, not supernatural, math's not the right word, but yeah. it's just so uh, amazing. And then you hear the voice coming in the background, yeah. right? Uh, and it's just, whoa! Just, yeah, the sets. Ken Adam, Ken oh, Adam. my God. He did a fabulous job, and he started in Dr. No. Yeah. yeah and, all, and all Peter Lark carried that forward, too. I mean, it's it's they've really done a good job with that whole set concept. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the volcano in uh, You Only Live Twice, and every everything has been, like they yeah. said, Cubby and Saltzman said, hey, leave it on yeah, the screen. Quite the imagination. Yeah. Just incredible. Even, even the Duke of Wellington portrait in Dr. No's Lair, I mean, which had really been stolen from the, the National Gallery a few years before. It's like, right. Dr. No's got it. It's like, oh, <laughs> that was like, that was cool. <laughs> that was classic. Did they ever find the painting? Was that painting ever yes. recovered? Yes. That, yeah, oh, it's it there okay. now. Tom and I saw it at yeah. the, in the National Gallery a few years ago. All right, so we finally, we see, a, of course, the introduction of humor, too, in, in the Bond movies, and Sean Connery had some quips and so on, and but they, they got a little funnier with, of course, Roger Moore and et cetera. But we do see this introduction is part of his persona in Bond. And then gadgets. Now, you didn't see very many gadgets in Dr. No. I mean, he had the Geiger counter, basically, and that was pretty much it. You didn't see much, but we're going to see gadgets obviously as they go forward as that has changed so we got that i think eric and P pietro mentioned the exotic locations and morgan as well so you got all that going on and there's a time where people didn't travel like that so right and then we hear of specter for the first time now we're not going to hear about it <laughs> for some other parts of the bond franchise when they didn't have the rights to it but it does raise his ugly head once again towards the end of the franchise's uh, last couple of movies here. So, mm -hmm. and then we got great poster art. Uh, a lot of movies had great poster art, so you can't say Bond was different in that respect, but you're going to see great poster stuff and great artwork from the Bond franchise from that point forward as well. Really good stuff. Yes. And the, a point on Spectre is very clever of the producers uh, to put that into Do into Dr. No, you know, originally they wanted to make Thunderballs, the first film, but it was in litigation. Yes. yes. So they couldn't do it, but they used Spectre wisely knowing that they would be using that name future mm -hmm. on film. So they made Dr. No a member of Spectre. Yep. So introducing that was very, very smart. Yeah. Yeah. That was great. And that was our first introduction to it. And that's kind of cool. And then we have the ending of course, with bond with the girl and oftentimes in a boat or a floating craft. <laughs> right. <laughs> How many movies is he in? Oh, yeah. Especially a yellow floating rubber craft. <laughs> that happens a lot. But here he is with Honey Rider at the end with her. And again, we see that for the first time here in Dr. No. All right. So I think we've covered a lot of how Dr. No influenced the rest of the Bond franchise here. Oh, just a little bit of trivia I wanted to get in there about uh, the casino scene. If you notice in Dr. No, Bond is sitting in uh, seat number six and Trench is in seat number 11. In Honor Majesty's Secret Service, Bond is in seat number six. And when uh, Diana Rigg, huh? Tracy, is over, she's bending over number 11. Oh. So the six and the 11 positions oh, at the back row table, Shimon Defer, are used know that. in those two films. So we'll look for it. That's pretty good. Way to go, Morgan. Sure. Hey, that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us today, Morgan, Pietro, and Eric. We love to have you. Thank you for inviting us. You bet. Thank you. Well, I just want to say you guys do a fantastic job. Absolutely love it, you guys. Oh, thanks, Morgan. You guys are awesome. Yes, it's been it's been fun. Yeah, yeah great. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Great talking to you guys about this. Yeah, it's terrific. Pleasure, sir. Awesome. I see you again, Tom. Good to see you, too. Yeah. This has been Dan Silvestri. And Tom Pizzotto. Of SpyMovieNavigator.com and our show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. Please subscribe to our show in your favorite podcast app and on YouTube. 
where we have some cool videos and visual podcasts. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Thanks for listening. We appreciate it.